introduce Tom, who is one of Los Angeles's treasures. Um, he is the acting chair of the undergraduate fine art department at Art Center. He received both his MA, BFA and MFA from CalArts and began teaching art history in 1981. He joined Art Center in 1995 and became full-time in 2002, teaching in both fine art and illustration programs. Um, his work uh, has been seen in On Wanting to Grow Horns, The Little Theater of Tom Nectel, a mid-career survey that was at the Otis Ben Maltz Gallery and then traveled the country in 2002. Really amazing show and also a beautiful publication that accompanies it. In September of last year, there were two simultaneous exhibitions of his work here in LA. The Reader of His Own Self, Graphic Work, 1979 to 2016 at CB1 Gallery, and Astrolabe, Recent Work, at Mark Selwyn Fine Art, who, which is his dealer here in LA. In addition to numerous solo and group exhibitions since 1975, his work is in the public collections of the Berardo Collection, the Sintra Museum of Modern Art in Portugal, the Museum of Modern Art New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the Hammer Museum, LA County Museum of, of Art, Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Orange County Museum of Art, and the Long Beach Museum of Art. Among his awards and fellowships are the McDowell Colony Fellowship, the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant, a City of Los Angeles Individual Artist Fellowship, and the California Community Foundation Fellowship for Visual Arts. Um, and I've been following Tom's work for many, many years, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce him. Tom, thank you. Is it okay if I turn off the lights? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks, thanks for inviting me. What I would like to talk with you about uh, tonight is a point in my work that I arrived at where I felt that I needed to rethink how the work functioned for myself. It's a kind of a dilemma that I think most of us of artists, as artists encounter in our work. And I think it's a dilemma that particularly I remember starting when I was in grad school. So I thought that this might be interesting to talk with, about you, with you guys about how this worked for me, this kind of dilemma where you have to rethink the work and what kinds of problems you find in doing that. Um, by way of, of Introducing that, why don't I show you a, a few of my older works so you can get a sense of where I started. This is a painting called A Mare's Nest. Um, it's about, I'm terrible at figures, it's about six and a half feet tall to give you an idea of scale, and it's, about, and it's, it's oil on linen. Um, the paintings that I was known for, or that I have been known for, tend to be um, large, sprawling kinds of paintings. I always, I always thought of, the distinction in my work prior was that, for me, was that the paintings were like these big, messy, operatic events that would take place in which many things were going on. And it was a very polyglot language. There were lots of different ways the painting was being used to speak about different things, and that the drawings were much more focused. And so, in the end also, it was an important aspect of the painting for me that I did not plan out the painting, that I never, I never, I started off with just a title and a very rough sketch and I found that the rougher and the simpler it was the better always because in a way part of the challenge of the painting was the challenge of really inventing what was happening as I was doing it and inventing where, where the thinking was going, finding out what I wanted to think about. The, the paintings and the drawings have always been very much to me about thinking which we'll talk about a little bit more later. So in this painting, there's, there's a, a man who's wearing sort of an enormous ruff. The ruff becomes this whole world around him. There's ha multiple halos. The halos are composed of like wrestling men and creatures poking through greenery. And you know, there's just this huge melange going on of things while up above is this kind of other dream world which is pouring itself down onto him. In many ways, the work that I did was 
work that over the years, this wasn't something I planned out, but it was over the years as I would look back over the work, bodies of work, I would realize that part of what I was painting about oftentimes was how the imagination functioned and how it functioned as a kind of double-edged sword. But on the one hand, the imagination was liberating, the imagination was someplace you could go where you could be completely free. I was, you know, I was very, I'm very marked by the fact that when I was 14 years old, my mother showed me William Blake and I kind of fell in love and never got over it. <laughs> and William Blake became kind of my godfather. And so, like Blake, I, you know, I believe very much that you turn inwards, not outwards. You, you turn in towards yourself. And so the paintings were very much about the imagination being this kind of liberation. But at the same time, as I grew older, oftentimes the imagination was, at the same time it was liberating, you paid a price for it. If you were dwelling too much in the imagination and not enough in the real world, eventually the imagination strips itself out. And that's kind of, in a way, what happens in the work for me. This is a painting from a subsequent show called The Wall of City, um, where in this case, sort of, there's this kind of world, a monochrome world that surrounds this werewolf character, um, where this kind of diagrammatic approach takes place. Um, here's a, a detail into, into this world. Um, they were, you know, these were intoxicating paintings to make for me. But um, they were intoxicating in terms of not knowing where they would go and watching this world kind of grow up and figuring them out and watching my, my own obsessions sort of reappear in the work in different forms, one after another. Um, at the same time, the drawings functioned very differently. The drawings were... Um, sort of monolithic. I mean, or they, I was actually the way I was thought of it. I was thought of the paintings as opera, and the drawings as chamber music. So you know, the opera it's like you know lots of people rushing in and off the stage, and the stage hands and everybody, and then the chamber music is just a few instruments really focused. And so the drawings were often like this pastel. This is <coughs> probably about twenty-two by thirty. Um, they were drawings where I would draw as much with an eraser as I would draw with a pastel pencil um, so that I could sort of create this language where I could go back and forth. And they were, oh, I want to go back and say one thing. There, it, and there's part of what also was a very important part of this work for me was that there was what I always thought of as this big repertory company of characters. And it was very important to me that they were not in any way symbolic in and of themselves. So in other words, I didn't use goats because goats, to me, represented something. I used sort of a cast of characters who either sort of tickled my sexual fantasies or were interesting because of how their structures worked and how their, their, their inherent personality seemed wired. And so... Um, there was this repertory company of characters that ran through my work. Um, one of the, the main figures that appeared in the work for years were these wrestlers. Um, there was a point, this is a drawing from a show in 2011. This is a drawing called Gatmalata. It's named after the Donatello statue in Padua of, of, a, of a condottieri riding his horse, and it's one of my favorite works of art. In this case, I sort of thought of it as if both the the mount and the rider were combined into one figure, a kind of a centaur figure, where this, this man in this great sort of voluminous um, dress is moving forward. Um, a couple things about this. One thing was, when I started using the men in the dresses, which was about 1991 or so, they first started to appear in the work, and I, I swear, I swear on my mother's name, <laughs> that when I started doing it, I didn't think in any kind of conscious way about it. I just, it seemed like a really fabulous way to dress these men up. And Mira Shore, who's a very close friend of mine, whose work I'll talk about in a minute, um, I remember Mira coming into the studio and seeing the first images with the men in dresses, and she said, you know, Tom, these aren't the kinds of dresses that women like to wear, and they're not even the kinds of dresses that drag queens really like to wear. These are the dresses that an eight-year-old boy thinks a very pretty woman wears. And I always thought, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> it's one of those things where somebody tells you something about your work that is so pertinent that in a way you kind of think, okay, 
don't touch that too much. Don't, don't go too deep into it right now, because if you do, you're going to kind of strip out the layers of contradiction that can exist in it. Um, the other thing that was interesting, which actually then was years later, Mira had another interesting observation when I was doing this drawing. She did this drawing, and it's this, um, you know, this big, bulky figure. There's something I've always loved about the idea of these big, bulky figures who are adorned as if they're parade floats. It kind of makes them even more magnificent, in a way. And Mira looked at this drawing, and she said to me, oh, this looks like Bob, who's my husband. And Bob is a rabbi, and Bob is not built like this. Bob does not look like this. But she had picked up very early on on something I had not thought about, which is that I was kind of hardwiring into my figures aspects of Bob's Parkinson's, which is something I'll talk about in a minute. And the way that his, his hands are held, the way that there's a kind of frozen look to his face, I wasn't aware that I was beginning to graft into these characters aspects of my personal life in ways that if, I think if I'd thought about it, I probably would have edited it out. And as you'll see, I think that's kind of what was one of the things that had to come to the fore and kind of rupture the surface of the work. This is the second one of the Gavimalada drawings. I always thought of this as the guy sort of raising up the skirts and letting the one who does the real thinking in the family <laughs> lean him forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is one. This is one of the paintings from a show in 2011. Um, this is called the Grasshopper's House. It's about five and a half by five and a half, roughly, I think. When I thought of this painting at the beginning, I thought, well, I, you know, actually, to be honest, I can't remember what I thought at the very beginning because in my notebooks. There's images of this ring, and then there's like water buffaloes, that, and, and, and all this stuff that kept getting taken out. And eventually, as I was painting it, I felt like what was happening was that I was taking a painting, and I was shaking it until everything in the painting was falling to the bottom. And I also felt at a certain point like I was painting about kind of the bankruptcy of the imagination, as if the bankruptcy, and I felt that that was both personal and political in a way. I felt like as I painted it, I was painting about a world in which nothing kind of, nothing in the painting makes the sort of sense that happened in the previous paintings. In the previous paintings, these, these, this repertory of characters I talk about kind of like react to each other, they talk to each other, things happen between them. This was a world where, where nothing quite is connected to anything else. And that wasn't how it started, but that's certainly how it ended up developing. And I thought about this as kind of a, a world where the personal imagination become bankrupt. My own imagination felt like it was being stripped out. But I also felt like I was painting about living in a culture where the imagination had been stripped out. Mm -hmm. Where culturally in our country, I think there's a kind of bankrupt imagination. And I don't want to go too far into it, risk of yeah. going too far afield. But I mean, I feel like we've seen the results of that, that we live in a country where the national imagination has, has gone off the rails. Um, it was also a painting that was, I, I don't want to explain everything that's happening in it, but, but there is one thing, which is that when I, when I was growing up, I had a toy theater, and the toy theater was a, a thing that you, um, it was invented in the late 18th century in England and throughout Europe, and in England it really took root, and somebody gave me one when I was like 14. And I loved the place. I, there were like these beautiful, sort of wonderful, um, early 19th century, very crude kinds of drawings. And so the writing in this comes out of one of the plays, Baron Munchausen, and this would be something you'd see written on the first page of the play, you know, all these, these things. And then it gets picked up like a fugue and repeated through the painting. The other thing over here is, I'm here as Alice in Wonderland, pulling back the curtain, you know, when she's going to unlock the store. Um, <laughs> The other thing about this painting was that it was excruciating to finish it. And it was, I remember, there was a point where some friends of mine invited me to go with them down to Mexico. They were taking a whole group of people down. And it was between terms at my school. And I remember saying no, because I had the feeling that if I didn't stay put and keep working at this painting and finish it, that if I walked away, I was never going to finish it. And I just had this feeling like I was somehow at the end of a long cycle that I had to sort of divest myself of. And when this show happened in 2011, 
And I'm so glad that none of the collectors who own these paintings are here tonight. Um, <laughs> I, know, I remember it was a very important moment for me because I remember looking at the show and really being aware there was only one painting in the show I liked, and it was the smallest painting. But the big paintings, I remember thinking, I remember thinking of this painting, okay, this, this painting is successful for me on its own terms. This painting <coughs> does what I want it to do, and it describes something that may be painful, but it's difficult, but it's, but it's, but it's something I need to do. It's about, it's about like a vacancy, about an emptying out. But I don't want to make these paintings anymore. And this painting was a small painting. It's called Flag. And I remember thinking that this was the only painting in the show that I felt like this is, there's some reason I have to hang on to this picture. I didn't want to sell it. I felt like it had something it had to keep talking to me about. And I think part of it was that it was, um, it was starting to talk in the language that the drawings used. It was sort of more monumental. It was more simplified. It was more focused. Um, there used to be a, um, a used clothing store in Beverly called Fierce Ruling Diva. And even though that's not the title of this painting, I remember from the very beginning, I remember thinking Fierce Ruling Diva, Fierce Ruling Diva. <laughs> that was sort of the, the direction I would go in. And um, it also felt to me very much, I love Tonka painting, Tibetan Tonka painting. And I remember feeling, while well, I was making this, I was sort of making a Tonka for myself. And so, so this stuck somehow. Um, but I finished that show. And I remember thinking, I can't do any more of the big paintings. I just can't. I don't know what I want to do, but I know I can't do those. And so I, I had a conversation with, with my dealer. And basically, I mean, I, it takes me a long time to do a show. So it's not like it was, this was like a production line that suddenly slammed to a halt. I mean, it, it, it takes me about usually three to five years to do a show. But I had a conversation and said, look, I really I need to go into the studio. I need to be able to work without knowing where I'm going to go. I need to have the permission that I'm going to give myself to do really bad work, and just to see where it goes, and you know, and we'll we'll see what happens. Um, and I made a lot of bad work, none of which I'm going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll see some bad work, but you won't see it. I mean, I really it it's it, it's a very liberating thing. I remember Monique Prieto, who's a painter here in LA, whose work I love a lot, talking about this once, about the liberation of just being able to go into the studio and make a bad painting. And that that kind of allows the work of art to really talk to you. You know, instead of trying to control the work of art so much, instead of trying to make the work of art sit up and beg and do what it's supposed to do, instead you really let the work of art do something that you can't control, something you don't understand, something you think is in bad taste, or something you think is, you know, um, naive or stupid, and then let it say something back to you. And so I, I, there, were, there was a lot of chattering going on in the studio for about a year and a half. It was not, it was not, it was all productive in that it moved me along. I, I wish that I was the kind of person where I could jump ahead, that I could think my way through something and jump ahead, but I can't. I have to sort of work my way through it. So I worked my way through a lot of stuff. Then I came to this interesting turning point. This is a little tiny dry point by Lovis Corinth. It's about maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe it's eight and a half by 10, maybe even smaller than that, actually, really. Um, Bob and I, saw this in a show up at the Cantor Museum at Stanford, a little show that was about the degenerate, the art that the Nazis thought was degenerate. Lovis Corinth had never interested me. He was an artist whose work I knew, but I never was interested in it. He was an artist who was, sort of came out of symbolism in the 19th century, which at one time I was really in love with. But it was always, there's always kind of an inherent vulgarity to his work. And also, I really, really sort of was repelled by the kind of um, life drawing aspects of the work. And yet, I found myself staring at this dry point and thinking, oh, this is really interesting. I can tell that when he did this, he didn't look down at the plate. He was just looking in a mirror at himself, and he wouldn't let himself look down at the plate. And the result is there's this kind of image where it looks like his face is collapsing under psychic pressure. That's an interesting idea. I should do that. 
I've never drawn from life, and I've never drawn myself looking in a mirror. What would happen if I did that? Okay, so now to explain why this was something that made me want to throw up, <laughs> Let me take you back to CalArts. <laughs> um, I went to CalArts, as Karen mentioned, for my bachelor's, my master's. I, I went to CalArts in 1972 when I was only two years old. And I, at the time that I went there, CalArts was in sort of the backwash of 60s educational theory. So for instance, you didn't have to send them any grades, there were no grades. Um, the assumption was the moment you got in, you were an artist. There were no basic classes. There was no life drawing. There was nothing like that. Um, you sent them, I sent them my journal. I sent them a journal of drawings, and they let me in based on that. Um, this, to give you an idea of the kind of Apollonian, Dionysian dynamic of CalArts, this is the, the main gallery in 1973. <coughs> you know, big and spare and empty, filled with big, spare, empty, minimalist paintings. And this is the exact same place during one of the parties. <laughs> and this kind of was, it just made my head spin. You know, this kind of, I couldn't figure out whether I was going or coming. Um, and I arrived at CalArts really knowing, and I'm not exaggerating, nothing about contemporary art. I didn't know about abstract expressionism. I didn't know about pop art. I remember going to my interview with Nancy Chun and Stefan von Heun and them saying, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to make illuminated books just like William Blake. And <laughs> Stefan very gently said, well, maybe you want to go in the illustration program. No, no, no. <laughs> and so, and, and when I arrived at CalArts, I was really in love with the Pre-Raphaelites, who were, as I'm sure you all know, a, a school of 19th century British painters who had this very romantic idea that the painting that took place before Raphael was pure, was somehow more, um, more, I don't want to say virtuous, but it was a pure kind of painting. What they produced was a kind of Renaissance fair of Victorian men and women dressed up in armor and so forth. This is a, a little, it's a very little watercolor by Dante Gabriel Rossetti called The Wedding of St. George and Princess Sabra, which I remember I just loved when I was about, what, 19, when I guess 19 or 20 when I went to CalArts. So I arrive on the doorstep of what is arguably at that time sort of the leading contemporary art school wanting to do this. <laughs> and, and I was very lucky. I was really lucky. CalArts in its earliest years was very open to oddballs. Paul Brock, who was the dean of the art school, was very, this is not Paul, but Paul was very kind and very welcoming of all sorts of points of view. And I had really wonderful, wonderful teachers. And this is one of them, this is Jerry Ferguson. Jerry was a conceptual artist. He was Canadian. He taught at the Nova Scotia School of Art and Design in Halifax, and he was at CalArts for a year. He was my first art history teacher at CalArts, and then I took his post-studio art class, which I still don't know how I got in that class. I, mean, I just I had no idea what it was. And Jerry was unfailingly kind and empathetic. He was very tough, but he was very kind and empathetic, and he gave me two pieces of advice that really became sort of my guiding point for getting through my education. One of them was, he said, well, given the, the way you think and who, given the kind of work you make and the kind of work you're interested in, you should spend as much time reading as you spend painting. And that was actually not about theory. It was about just reading. Just reading is pleasure. And I just, that, I loved reading, so I took that as total permission. I just, I began wallowing in 19th century novels and poetry and history and theater and everything I loved. And the other thing he said that was really smart was he said, he, he read a paper I'd written about the Pre-Raphaelites, and he said, well, you know, I find this work kind of, you know, revolting, but, you know, if you're, if you really, but, you know, he'd he sort of, you know, criticized the paper and made, made lots of good points. And he said, you know, really, if you love this work so much, you should look at who they're looking at. And so once you look at, you know, 14th century Italian painting, you can't go back to the Victorian era, you know, it just doesn't work. And I fell in love with people like the Lorenzetti's, This Is Good Government, which is still one of my favorite paintings. I, and it became a really interesting way to start thinking always, was that if I loved something, then go look at what that, pe that person was, you know, the writers that person was looking at, or the, you know, the artists that they were looking at, or the filmmakers. And that kind of 
chasing things down became very much a part of my education. But in the meantime, I had this to deal with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I could not, when I, especially that first year, I could not figure out what to do. I, it was just a complete puzzle to me. Um, this is a Frank Stella painting, and I, my friend Bernard Cooper, who's a, an artist and a writer, has a wonderful phrase when he's confronted with something he doesn't know what to do with. He says, I don't know what to eat it with. I didn't know what to eat any of modern art with. I just could not, and I remember sitting in the library and looking through Art Forum, desperately looking for stuff that I thought would look like what I might want to make, and I remember the only thing I could find that was figurative was Philip Perlstein, and I really wanted to open my veins rather than make yeah. these paintings. Um, I have more of a grudging admiration for them now, but not that much. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, at the time, I remember I thought, oh my god, they're, they're so devoid of pleasure, and they're pasty, and I just, oh, I, I, is this what I have to do? And the kind of the thing that sort of saved me, in a way, and it's, that's melodramatic, but it's not a really exaggeration, was there was a student show, and in the student show was this painting. This is by Mira Shore. This is part of a triptych she did of her having an affair with a bear. And it's done with gouache on paper. And I remember looking at this and just, I mean, it was like one of those things where somebody, you see something, it's like you've been plugged into a light socket. You're just like, Zzzz. and I thought, this is, it's personal. It's kind of fantasy, but fantasy hardwired into an inner universe. It, it was, even though this was something I didn't understand at the time, it was an aesthetic born out of Indian miniature painting, which later I became passionate about. Um, it was also something that was a very intimate scale. It wasn't like some giant painting on the wall demanding that you bow down in front of it. It was a very, you had to, you had to approach it, you had to read it in a way. And I loved this painting. And, and the other thing that was really important was that Mira was, she was, I was, you know, like basically a sophomore. Mira was in her last year of grad school. But Mira was close to me in my age, basically. And that was the first time I had a peer whose work just made me, you know, fall over. And that was a very important turning point, was to feel like, okay, this is a colleague whose work really excited. This isn't somebody in history. This isn't somebody far away. This is one of my colleagues who's done a painting that makes me want to swoon. And that was really important. This is a painting Mira did a few years later. There were a whole series of these very small paintings. They're only about six inches high on torn paper with these sort of empty dress vessels, again with gouache. And all of the subsequent years of, of Cal Art were really a process of kind of charting my own aesthetic through the really interesting experiences of, of who I got to work with. So for instance, Pat Steer was a very big influence on me. Um, this is a painting called Border Lord that's from about 73. And these paintings of Pat's in which the painting functioned as a field in which there were personal notations, formal notations, the painting as a kind of almost a journal or notebook of its becoming it was something that was very powerful to me. It was also very powerful to work with Pat. I told her years later that it was like working with some sort of a you know Zen master where you go in every week and the Zen master hits you with the stick and you know you you know you have the cone you can't solve and they hit you again. It was really, I mean, she was very rough, but it was great. It was, I would go every week, I would do drawings, and I, would, I desperately wanted to please her, and I'd go in and bring these drawings in, and she'd look at the drawings, and she'd say very firmly, not unkindly, but very firmly, she'd say, these are very handsome, but they're not drawing. Drawing is about drawing. And I just could not wrap my head around that. But I mean, part of what was interesting was that what was powerful was that what I absorbed from Pat was the sense that every time you made a mark, it carried meaning, and it didn't matter how, you know, you didn't have to try so hard to make it, to force the meaning. Every time you made a mark, it, it carried sensation, it carried feeling, it carried thought. It just, it, it was inherent in the act of making the mark. Um, one of the other people who was a big influence on me was Alexis Smith, who I worked with in my last year of grad school. And Alexis, with the way that she would take bits of text from from authors that she knew and loved. In this case, this is a Raymond Chandler piece. And then she would pair it with objects. 
And what I loved about her work was I felt like between the text and the object was this electricity flowing that was like the way that when I read, I free associate, I think about other things. Things are floating in this kind of ether that plug themselves into the text and open parts of the text up. And that what Alex was showing me was essentially that I could, ways I could bring literature and storytelling and language into my work, but they would operate at tangents to my work, and, and the meaning could operate by, in tangential ways. And that was very, very important. So thus, by the time I got to my graduate show, I was doing, this is one of the works of my graduate show, in which there's a rice paper horse who's kind of a long Mobius strip tied in a knot, and then paintings that hang from it. A little stealing from my mm -hmm. colleague here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, the result was I had gone through my whole arts education and never had done anything where I drew from life or painted from life, let alone painting myself looking in a mirror. Both of these are Philip Pearlstein. Um, and and that everything in my education made me want to run in the other direction from that. Thus, when I was really stuck, I thought, well, okay, if you're really stuck, one of the best things you can do is go do exactly the thing you think you should not do. Do the thing that you think is really repellent and awful and terrible because then it'll sit up on its hind legs and it'll tell you something. And so I decided I would start doing drawings. And I, I decided it was important for me, this is not one of my drawings, <laughs> this is by Guercino. It was, it was important for me to do it with ink because I, I had had kind of this developing fascination with ink. Even though the drawings that I showed you were pastel, and those were the drawings that I largely did, I more and more loved how ink worked. I loved that ink was emphatic, that it was, it was declarative, that to follow that thing I mentioned you know, from Pat, that it was something that you, know, you, you stated something. Every time you made a mark, the mark stuck there. I couldn't take my eraser and adjust it, or change it. I couldn't take and do a preliminary drawing. It was just there was something about just drawing straight onto the paper with the ink that it kind of derailed a lot of my control tendencies. Um, so, for instance, I began thinking about different ways that that people had used ink. This is Alfred Kuban, and Kuban is a German artist. He's been getting more and more attention lately. He's best known still for work he did at that was sort of symbolist period work, so like 1890 to 1910. They're very controlled charcoal drawings of really sort of incredibly nightmarish sort of scenes. But he had a whole career that went on after that, and a career that I'd never really looked at until I'd spent time in Germany and was looking through Muse bookstores and, and finding all these books illustrated by Kuban. And he had this kind of scribbly, scratchy kind of illustration style. And when I first ran into these, I thought, ugh, God, no, no control, no discipline, you know. <laughs> and then I started coming back to them and thinking, well, but maybe that's something that's interesting to think about. That, that maybe the drawing where the drawing is more about scribbling, maybe the drawing is more about a kind of frantic movement, maybe there's other ways into this issue. The other person I was thinking about as I was moving into this work that may seem to come out of left field, but is John Copland's who's a wonderful artist who I think his work is not seen enough now. And he is an artist who did these amazing, he was known as a writer and an editor, but he also did these pho photographic works where he, he would photograph his own aging body. And he would do it that was really in a way about formalism. It really was not about, oh, you know, I'm so sad about my body or something like that. It wasn't like that at all. It, they were really very formal works. And as a result, they kind of stripped away layers of sentiment, layers of, um, I guess I would say, ersatz emotion about looking at one's own body. They were very powerful, moving things to me. And I kept finding myself thinking about that as I was starting to approach this problem of how to start drawing myself. So I, I began just drawing in the studio, drawing myself. and. Um, Again, I think it's a process which is, it, it came loaded with all sorts of things I had to get over. I had a problem because part of it, what I struggled with was I had encountered many times in the past people who drew from life or artists who worked figuratively that involved working from life. 
And it seemed to me I always heard a kind of lingering moralism to the whole process, that somehow if you drew from life, it was better. It was more authentic or something. And I was like, oh, please. I, you know, I, and I still don't believe that at all. I just, I, that has no resonance for me. Um, the other thing I had to get over was the whole idea of resemblance, because in that I got distanced with pretty quickly because I just couldn't draw that really that well. I, 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 I think when I think about people whose work I admire who work in portraiture, and I think about like Dan McCleary, I think about Alice Neal, um, I think about somebody like even Don Bacardi. Those are people who devoted their entire working life as artists to negotiating that territory between what the life of an art object is as an object and what a resemblance is and how resemblances work. And I think they're two separate issues. And I realized that for me, I thought, I'm in my 60s. I don't want to waste my time worrying about whether it looks like me. And I don't want to waste my time worrying about whether I look good or not. <laughs> Talk about a lost cause. And so <laughs> I thought, you know, I want to make a drawing that comes to life. So I have to throw out the idea of worrying about whether it is whether it, there's a resemblance or not, which I found was, was disconcerting times sometimes when people started coming into my studio. At first, I didn't let anybody in the studio. But then when I started bringing people in, one of the things I would hear would be everything from is this so-and-so, like some other artist, I, you know? <laughs> or, or the ones I really loved were the people who'd come up to me and say in a very reassuring voice, you know, you don't look that old. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you really are very good looking. <laughs> I, no, no, that's not what this is about. <laughs> and and it, was, it was liberating. I would come into the studio, I'd come into the house at the end of working in the studio, and Bob would say, well, how's it going out in the studio? And I'd say, oh my god, I'm doing the worst drawing she could ever imagine. And he'd go, good, good, you're working, you're working. And gradually, I began getting used to the kind of rhythm of looking at myself and trying to dismantle something about my appearance and find something that could become interesting to me. Um, and I spent less time worrying about you know, the inherent, you know, Ersatz morality of drawing from life and more time about just being really fascinated about what was happening as I made a drawing where I couldn't predict where it was going. And also the other I made a couple of rules for myself. The rules were I had to finish every single drawing I started. So I couldn't do a drawing and think, oh fuck, I I drew the eye wrong. I just every drawing had to be finished. It had to go all the way through and I couldn't throw out anything. Now, that wasn't because I treasured these drawings at all. It, the idea was I wanted to just dismantle the critical apparatus that was going on in my head. The, the, side, the side of me that was going, oh, you did that wrong, start over. Or the side of me that was going, oh, God, you don't want anyone to see that. Just dismantle it. And then that way, come back later and see what you think about it. Come back later and see if maybe there's something that happened in the drawing that made your stomach flop over because it's not that it was bad, it's that it just doesn't look like anything in your language, and maybe you need to use that somehow. So these are all, these are all, and they're all just, you know, ink, ink and a, a drawing nib on different, different kinds of paper. I have a real paper fetish, so they're different kinds of paper, but this one's called Husk, and this one's called Black Dog. Um, and for the longest time, I just drew myself. Um, I, I really just, I felt too uncomfortable about exposing other people to this process. I felt too uncomfortable about um, what they would think of what I would do to them. Um, but eventually, I began to work Bob into the drawing. So Bob is in the background in this drawing. This is when we were living in Berlin for a while. Um, I also found that part of what was interesting to me as I drew them was that a kind of dismantling of myself, a dismantling of myself in the work of art, that a lot of times it was interesting to draw everything around me and to somehow make the parts of it that were me things that were being taken apart gradually. This is the last drawing that I, that I did in that particular group in Berlin. This was in the, the studio that I was working in. Um, they, 
they also became drawings where, uh, when I went to Berlin, I had this whole thing about how I was going to take Bob and put him in a chair beside me, and we were both going to look in the mirror together, and I was going to draw both of us and see what would happen. Well, Bob has Parkinson's, and when you have Parkinson's, you can't control your movements. And at first, I had this very romantic idea of, oh, it'll be great, I'm going to draw Bob, and he'll keep moving, and I'll just keep drawing him over him. But, you know, the reality is it's also incredibly uncomfortable for somebody who has Parkinson's to sit there for two hours while you draw them. And so eventually, I had to start working with photographs. And that was good, because it kind of started to break open the language again in another way. So I was drawing different, different kinds of sources. Um, the other thing I began doing was opening. I, the only people I would draw would be Bob and my parents. It was like, those were the people in a kind of circle of intimacy that I could draw. I, I mean, I, I have a lot of friends. I have them close to my sisters. A lot of people that you know I'm intimate with, but somehow, my parents and Bob were the only people I could really allow myself to let my guard down and do these drawings. Also, I think it was interesting. I didn't really think about this ahead of time, but I think the other thing was that my parents and Bob, none of them are people who are vain. Um, they they never asked to see the drawings. My parents never asked to see that. I think that my parents found it kind of excruciating, actually, to have their son drawing them. I don't, I don't think that was their idea of fun in the sun. Um, I remember, in fact, that I would I would draw them. We would watch TV together, and I would draw them. And then after maybe 40 minutes, my mother would say very quietly but very firmly, I think that's enough. <laughs> so, um, and both my parents died during the period I was doing these drawings. So there was a sense also, and I, and I didn't know they were going to die, but, I, but they, were, they were old and they were frail. And I had a sense that, that I wanted to make these drawings because I, I, I was very close to them. And I felt like, okay, I have to do these drawings so I can kind of hold, I'm stitching something that holds them close to me. They're going to go away soon. I'm, I'm weaving this thing that's going to hold them close somehow in some kind of atavistic sense. My, my mother, at the very end of her life, my, after my, my dad had died, and then about eight months later, my mother died, and in the last month of her life, I was showing her some of these drawings. I sort of screwed up my courage and thought, well, I'm going to... And my parents were very supportive, I have to say. My parents were very supportive of my work. They really, you know, my mother always asked, how's your work going? So, but, so I said, well, I want to show you these drawings I did of you and dad. And I remember I showed her the drawings, and and I got the Virginia Nectal Critique, which was, hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, high praise. <laughs> and the other person that I drew, as I said, was Bob. And Bob, in Parkinson's, this interesting thing happens, which is, in Parkinson's, what happens is your brain stops manufacturing dopamine. And so it stops sending those signals to your muscles to tell your muscles to do things like walking and so forth. One of the things it does that's interesting is it stops sending signals to your face. So when you have a conversation with somebody who has Parkinson's, oftentimes you may think, oh, they're really <coughs> bored, or they don't like what I'm saying or something. Well, it's not that. It's that they, they, you know how when you talk with somebody and you kind of mirror each other? You know, one person says something funny and you kind of smile or you know, they say something sad and your eyebrows tilt up sympathetic. Well, that goes away. <laughs> so conversations with Bob are really interesting. And so I began drawing him partly because it was interesting to, to catch this immobility and to catch what was happening with his body. Um, his feet were fascinating because his feet would clench up so tight that his toes would disappear. still happens. They disappear underneath so it looks like, it looks like there's no toes. The other thing that was interesting about drawing Bob but there were, there were many things. Um, one thing that was it brought me up against another one of my prejudices. And the prejudice was, I thought, you know, this is very problematic. I'm drawing my ailing partner, and I feel as if to draw somebody who is physically ailing is creating inherent content or inherent meaning, which I don't believe in. So in other words, the, audi the viewer will feel sympathy because the person in the drawing is sick. And I thought, I don't believe that. But on the other hand, I felt like, oh, I have to draw what's happening with Bob and I because we're, we're so, you know, this is, this is my experience. This is, if I'm making drawings where a mark represents experience, this is the experience that is going on around me. This is the sensation that's happening. I have to record this. There were some drawings I did where I began to work just 
I found I needed sometimes in order to try to describe what I was watching Bob go through, I had to draw from imagination, not draw from life. And so these were, there was these drawings I was doing about watching Bob at night. We were in this apartment in Berlin. There was this huge wall that was made of, of, of a bookshelf. And the first night in the apartment, I realized that the bookshelf was not anchored to the floor or the wall or the ceiling, that it could be pushed over, and Bob falls a lot. And thereafter, every, I, first when I realized this, I told him, if you're ever falling, fall away from the bookshelf, because it would destroy the entire apartment if it fell over. And then thereafter, every time Bob got up in the middle of the night, I would wake up too and watch him until he got back into bed, because I was so terrified about what was going to happen. So I, I had these nights where I would sit there just watching Bob move in these, you know, these huge, it was like an old early 19th century building that had been converted into apartments with these big doors, watching Bob move through the dark. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I, I still don't know what I think about these. I still, my prejudices are still intact. I, I, I question how easy it is to do work about physical frailty of another without tapping into sentimentality. I, I think about Hannah Wilkie's work that she did when she was dying of cancer and how powerful that work is. It's really amazing work. But that's different. That's kind of charting the self. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I think is. I do know that part of what happened was that in charting Bob's frailty and Bob's physical experiences, that because it's a marriage, I really began charting my own body in a way and thinking about my own body and what was happening to it. This is the first painting I did after I started doing this. This is a painting called The Vision of St. Eustace. It's about whew, five and a half feet tall, I think. Um, it's oil and linen. Um, the ribbon is legible, but the ribbon is something that it takes time to read. Um, you have to really stand still and you really look at the ribbon. You have to, you can trace what's being, what's on the ribbon that's being stated, but you have to really spend time with it and look. I wanted something that slowed somebody down in the same way that somehow the physicality of Bob slowed me down, where I had to spend time with Bob's physicality and understand what the text of his body was, as it were. Um, this is based on one of my favorite paintings in the world, which is The Vision of St. Eustace by Pisanello which I've loved since I was, when, since Jerry Ferguson told me to go look at these paintings. And, and I, I, loved, I loved the hallucinatory nature of it. I love the wildly shifting scale that happens where there's a rabbit running through a woods that appear to be you know, miniature. And one of the, my favorite things in the painting was always this dog with this scroll underneath with nothing written on the scroll. And I read something recently where the suggestion was that Pisanello had put nothing on the scroll as a way of saying that language could not compete with visual images, that visual images trump language. Mm. I don't know if that's true or not, but I love that. But I decided in my painting, the scroll sort of goes, goes to town and explodes all over the body of this person. And then meanwhile, the dog is down here waiting to start running. And I'm up in the, the only thing I did from life was the painting of me up in the, the upper left. And this is a close-up of the, the language and of Bob in the painting. And there were, there were two paintings in the show. I'm not showing you the other one, because the other one, I, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I wanted to do a painting about a chaotic body. And I wanted to do a painting about a chaotic, I, st I thought, I started out thinking I was going to do a painting about a chaotic body, and it would be Bob's body. And then as I painted in it, I realized, no, it's not Bob's body, it's both of our bodies, it's, it's both of our bodies as one body. I think it was just, it was one of those things where you tackle something, you just, you, you just can't make it work. I mean, the paintings, you know, was in the show, people seem to like it, but for me, I think part of the problem was it falls back into the language of the earlier work. It ends up becoming too polyglot, too many, too many gear shifts in the painting language, trying to make too many parts all fit together, whereas this painting was more interesting because I think it's simpler. There's shifts in language, but the, lang the shifts in language don't become this kind of, you know, chatter that happens. And then there were smaller paintings in the show. And again, the smaller painting, in a, in a funny way, I realized at the end of this show, 
that maybe part of what was happening was that there was this sort of very gradual shifting that was taking place where the paintings were becoming, the paintings I like, that I'm interested in, become simpler, more quiet, more direct. And then, as you'll, as you'll see, the drawings are starting to go in all directions. The drawings are starting to get to be the ones that kind of spill all over the place. So this is a painting called Flounder and Heron, um, in which a poor flounder meets its fate. This was actually based on, how was that for a tease? Um, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is actually based on, there, was a, there are two beautiful Kronach paintings in Berlin in the Kamalda Gallery that I just love. That are these paintings of Venus. And they're immense, they're like nine feet tall. And part of what I love in Cranach is this ability that he has to paint something as a silhouette, and yet it's not cut out and applique onto the surface. It's kind of, it has depth and it has volume, but it's very sharp the way the silhouettes were. And there's something very hypnotic about the idea of <coughs> silhouette and form and the apparition, the apparitionality of that. So this was my attempt to make a Cranach painting, basically. Mm -hmm. And then this is actually just, this is kind of misleading to have it blown up this big, because it's only about eight, eight by 10. It's a very small painting. It's called Salamander. And I had this painting in my studio for a long time. And part of what I found it interesting to do was that I would not, when people would look at it, I wouldn't say anything. I would just let them look at it. And inevitably, after a while, then they would start. They would say, well, what is it? Is it, is it a toad? Is it an alien? Is it a brain? And the more they did that, the more I thought, that's exactly what I'm going through. I'm looking down at my crotch and going, what is it? <laughs> what happened down there? Is it a toad? Is it an alien? I mean, it, was a, it was an attempt to make a painting about how as you get older, your body just goes haywire. You just, and you don't know what's going on down there. It's, it's doing something different. Lots of knowing middle-aged laughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I began doing drawings in which I placed my own carnality in, I, I sort of drew down my body and into the picture so that I was looking down myself and then locating myself and, and then trying to draw everything I could see in the studio that in any way seemed to me to be of interest. So in this case, it goes all the way up to the top of the picture where you can see at the very top of the picture, you can see the bottom part of the St. Eustace painting. And then there's this photograph of Bob that I kept putting in, partly because that's a photograph of Bob when he was younger and before all the, the issues of Parkinson's came in. It's always an image I've loved of him. And I love the idea that there was this kind of Bob is eight years older than me, but there was a sense that in this drawing we were crossing each other somehow in time. In, in the photograph, he's younger than I am now. Or this, this one actually, by the way, is, this one's called Days of 2015, and it was, I was thinking about the Greek poet Kavafi has these poems he wrote uh, called, they're called Days of 1918, Days of, I can't remember, there's three of them, and I can't remember the dates in them. Anyway, in all of them, there are poems that are kind of elegiac accounts about boys he's loved and a sense of the past has a kind of longed for territory. And then James Merrill, who's another poet whose work I really love, went back and wrote two poems that were also called Days of, I think one of Days of 1995, and then there's another one, Days of 1964, I think. And so he was consciously referring back to Kavafi's work but then he was instead creating these poems that were kind of constructs about what it's like to be alive at that point in time. The one about 1995 is all about having AIDS and watching your death come towards you. And so this one is called Days of 2015 because I think both it had the kind of elegiac sense of you know thinking about Bob and when we were younger and then also thinking about looking down my aging body and sort of trying to draw what is, what is, this, thing, what is this envelope I'm inhabiting and where am I going in it? Where, is it? where is it taking me? So in this drawing, I took it further. I really, this is called I Stand in the Mess of Myself, which is not my own line. That's a quote from, oh, his name went right out of my head just now. He wrote the, he wrote the book Let the Great World Spin. And I can't think of his name right now. Anyway, in, in that book, there's this one line where one character says, I stand in the mess of myself. And I thought, oh, that's perfect. 
So this is, and also here I began doing something that was not, I think, particularly noticeable necessarily, but it was noticeable to me. I wanted to slow down this kind of read that happens where people look at something like this and they think, oh, the person looked in the mirror. And I thought, well, okay, how can I jam the brakes on that a little bit? And I thought, well, what I'll do is that what is in the mirror position will actually be reversed from where it would be. So what is actually up here is not what I saw when I looked in the mirror, but I swapped it around. So the hand that's holding the photograph is not the hand that's down here. So I mean, it's, it's not something I expect anyone to see. It's just enough to kind of jam the brakes, hopefully, on how one moves through a drawing. And what was more important was that it began to reintroduce Alec fantasy into the work, in, but on my own, on a different set of terms. And so that, and, and first I have to apologize. These are the newest drawings, so they haven't been photographed yet, except by me taking my iPhone out and photographing them against a, you know, a drawing board. So please excuse the, the way they look. But, but in the newest drawings, now there's a way that I think I'm navigating back into the, ter into the territory of allegory and fantasy, but doing it through drawing myself. I was saying to somebody recently about the painting that I'll show you at the end, they're drawn from life, but they're not lifelike. And so this one is called Jack-O-Lantern Annunciation. Okay. It's me with Bob's foot and hand coming down from above towards me. Um, and this one's called Pedestal. And it's me with Bob balanced on top of my head. Here's a close-up of, of Bob and I. So. And then these are a set of drawings called Artist and Model, where Bob is sort of floating or falling, but when Bob falls a lot. Um, it's part of Parkinson's. You, you oftentimes you want to go somewhere and your feet don't oblige you, so you, you topple over. So in the drawings, Bob is kind of teetering and falling, and, and then I'm in the background drawing him over and over again. And this one's called Artist and Mouse. And um, <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. I like when people laugh at the work. <laughs> this, um, this, is, this, is, uh, this, was, this was an interesting drawing because, the, well, OK, let me, the mouse in this drawing is one. <laughs> I made this in grad school. <laughs> I, I used to make. Um, stuffed animals. That was the first, the first kind of making that I really did were stuffed animals. I began making them when I was about 10. And I made them. Oh, this is really the last one. And I made this when I was in grad school for my mom as a present. It's a mouse. She's wearing like a silk dress. She has taffeta under, you know, underneath. And she has, and she has a little painted fan. And, and when we took apart my parents' house, I told my sisters, oh, I want, I want this mouse. And so I put the mouse into the drawing. Um, and what was interesting, I'm gonna go back here one. Um, I, in the background, I, I put these postcards that have been on the wall of my studio for a while. They've traveled with me. They're a Cronach. One of the, the, the Cronach that's there on the left is one of the two Cronachs I was mentioning. And then there's this Picasso, this beautiful early Picasso drawing that is just so wonderful. These two sort of wonderful, tender, raw giantesses. And then this, this little painting that's by Degas that's in Avignon of a woman ironing. And I, well, two things. One thing was, the main thing was, I didn't realize until after the drawing was well underway that I was doing this drawing that was sort of about all these women, all these images of women, you know, this kind of, you know, sort of funny ersatz femininity and then the fact that it was made for my mother. So there were all these sort of feelings churning around about the women in my life. And as you can tell from, you know, the thing I showed you about Cal Arts, I mean, women have been very important in forming me and giving me my identity in many ways. Um, what was the other point I wanted to Oh, the other point I wanted to make about this was this, 
was again something that was a kind of art making that's made me queasy when I see other people do it. And in this case, I, I'm only, I only did it twice, and then I decided that was enough. And that was the, the queasiness comes from when artists do work in which they consciously quote the work of other artists. So here in the background of the painting are all the paintings I love by other people, all of which I totally get because I love art history and I love other people's work. But I'm not interested in that kind of quotation. I'm interested in synthesis. I'm interested in somebody taking something and synthesizing it into their own language for something new. But in the case of this drawing, the next one I'll show you, I just I let down my guard and decided, OK, I'm going to quote these things that I love and see how it works in the drawing. And I, it was interesting. It was interesting also insofar as, let me see if I've got, do I have a, yeah, it was interesting insofar as that there's this range of language that the drawing is becoming like how the paintings used to operate, where there's parts that are very intensely made, others in different kinds of representation, but also that in the reflection, by way of trying to say something about a reflection and how a reflection works and how we read them, I found that the part of the drawing where I did the least would be my image in the drawing. That that and that, that and the less I could do with my image, the more interested I was in how it was working. And it was almost like I was trying to dismantle the image of myself into as few marks as possible. And also, when I say as few marks, also not to worry about elegance or anything like that, not to sort of one mark that does everything, but just let it be something that just sort of evaporates in the back of the drawing. This is the second one I did. This is called The Artist in His Heart. And um, this really exists. <laughs> it's really when we when I, when we we were done, we were going through our bedrooms at, at our parents' house as we were taking the house apart, and I found a box filled with all of these things I had made, and I made this heart when I was about fifteen or sixteen. It's a psychedelic heart. It has an eyeball. It has a hand. It has this book that opens up that has the lyrics to "Greasy Heart" by Jefferson Airplane. It's just it's shameless, <laughs> and and. And it was something I thought was so hideous. And so I sort of wrapped it up in tissue paper and put it away. And then at a certain point, I thought, you know, that's the thing I should pull out and try and do a drawing of and see what it looks like. And in this case, what's in the back of the drawing, again, I just picked things that I had on the wall. But there is a, um, oh, again, his name went right out of my head. He's a German painter whose work I really love. He has this painting of St. John of Patmos in the unit. So there's a quote of that. There's this wonderful. Um, early 20th century bodybuilder who's wearing his collar cuff on his bicep and his thigh to show that they're all the same size, and then a clay drawing of an angel and a little painting of a heart that I did um, the year after I got out of CalArts. Here's a close-up of them. So the last thing I want to show you is then I finally made the jump to the inevitable thing, which is to start painting from life. And for the longest time, I used to think, as I was going through these last few years, I thought, well, OK, at some point, I'm going to have to paint from life. And every time I thought, oh my god, I just cannot face that. I can't face sitting there, you know, <laughs> trying to. And I, I don't think I knew how to make the language for it until I got through these drawings. When I got through these drawings, and somehow I sort of could see how the language could work. So this is a painting called Artist and Mouse. And it's smallish. It's a, oh, this big. And it's, it's a painting where you know, this whole middle part is, un, is unpainted. It's, it's vacant. And then the, the parts of it that become detailed, it was interesting. It made me aware that there was a way I could start to function in the work where, where flesh is apparitional, where what is flesh is like an apparition. In other words, it's something that you kind of see and you're not sure if you've seen it completely or not. There's a whole degree of uncertainty with the idea of an apparition. And that I could do something where the flesh could sort of evaporate and dissolve and become something else. I think, I think this is just the beginning. I think hopefully that can start to unmoor itself from kind of the center of the face and the hand and start to find other ways it can move through the body. Um, 
And also, it's interesting because I didn't really think until I did this painting, I was working on the mouse in this painting, and I thought, oh, look, that's kind of like the wrestler's gowns that I've been making. All these years I've been dressing my wrestlers up as mice. <laughs> so, this is a close-up of the face. The, the painting of the studio is actually just scratched. It's, I, there's a dark layer of paint that was dry, and then on top of it I put a, a thin layer of, of wet paint and then just scratched through it with a like a, a nail, and so what you're seeing is scratched through to the darker paint. And then this is the mouse. <coughs> I was not cut out to be a couturier. <laughs> there's, there's another mouse I found that I want to I wanted put into another painting, and it was a mouse that I made that I thought was my idea of an elegant 18th century lady. And you'll be fascinated to know that hot pink was a big color in the 18th century. <laughs> so. So that's, that's it. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Should we turn on lights? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Pete. <laughs> we, look, we look so much better with just one light switch. <laughs> Do you have any questions or any comments? Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Really, really thoughtful and important. Um, you talked a lot about your process. Uh -huh. um, and I'm just wondering, um, is, has process always been an important part of how you develop your work? Or has it been over time in your own practice? And like, at what point did you realize, oh, like, I am going to think a lot about a thing and do it and think a lot about a thing and do it? You know, well, you know, I'm, I'm actually glad you brought this up because this is one thing I realized recently. When I was at CalArts, all these teachers whose work I couldn't necessarily relate to at the time, um, they were all involved with process. They were, that was because it's the 70s, so it's really the time of process. Right? And even though I couldn't relate to it, I think their kind of ethos of making filtered into the back of my thinking so that even though I would never have said I was a process artist, mm -hmm. the whole way I made my paintings once, once I, there was a period where I did very elaborate watercolors. I would sort of take that out because that was so kind of goal oriented. But once I started oil painting and drawing and the drawings I did then, then it became the case that process was crucial to how meaning worked. That if I developed meaning before, before the piece, I felt the piece was flat afterwards. I felt it lacked contradiction. It lacked surprise. Mm -hmm. But if I allowed process to lead the way, then I could find myself running up against a wall I didn't expect. And that was always productive and interesting to me. Does that answer That's what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Well, like the silver points that you did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The silver points in the. But at the same time, there's. I mean, that's interesting because. Those are drawings I wouldn't do anymore, right. because there's a there's a perhaps a framework within cert, within which certain parts of process operate certain ways at certain times in your life, and then you you pass out of that. So, because the kind of delicacy that's in the silver point now, I'm not I'm not interested in. Yeah. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your mark making, and then you said different things uh, during your lecture yeah. about it. Um, so that you didn't want um, there to be content associated mm -hmm, necessarily mm -hmm. to the mark making right. or to the image. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, there are symbolic elements mm -hmm. in the mark making. So sometimes they also seem <coughs> to limit towards a musical notation, right. um, where they become a little bit baroque, uh -huh. um, and also very um, precise and well right. drafted. Right. Um, and s yeah, so I'm just wondering if you can kind of speak a little bit more about how you consider this question of of mark making and a refusal of content. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, that's really it seems, for me, it's a lot of the strength of the work is yeah. this relation to the content and how the mark becomes really 
imbibed with a certain effective tonality or right. you know a, a pondering about um, death. I mean, even that curly uh, scroll in the painting right. is, that isn't inscribed. It's as if like okay that that um, dog is going to pounce on the rabbit. So there's a right. kind of you know potential for to death that's in that scrolling of the mark. So yeah. it seems to me that there's a lot that's happening in your mark and that you're thinking a lot about mm -hmm. that. So maybe well, maybe maybe the way to parse it out is to mm -hmm. say that I think the important thing is not a refusal of content, but a um, a refusal of prior meaning in in the marks, and instead the permission that the mark can arrive at the meaning that seems appropriate as the piece goes on. Does that make sense? Because that's, that's, I think, what's going on, is that, in other words, I'm not interested. For the longest time, I used to say my work's not allegorical. People would say it's allegorical. And I'd say, well, it's not allegorical, because allegory is kind of A equals B. And I don't think my work does that. Now I'm, I'm a little bit less antsy about that. I'm a little bit more relaxed about that. But, but, it's, but it's that I think that you arrive at how meaning works through making the marks and seeing what the marks are, are actually doing, and then assigning content. The thing I always think about, there's that great Gombrich quote about first there's the making, then there's the matching. So first you make something, then you kind of figure out how it links up to things in the world, and you think, oh, here's how it makes meaning. It's, it's like this thing over here. It's not like this thing over here. It's rhyming with this thing over here. Therefore, it generates meaning in this kind of symphony of references. And that's what interests me, is how that kind of meaning can be conjured up. And you know, it's interesting what you're saying about the musical thing. I, um, I, I love that. That's one of the things that I want to, I would love to see infiltrate the work more. Actually, is the drawing as notation, the drawing as somehow notation that is not necessarily anchored to. Here's the space within which the, the representation of reality takes place. But it's somehow, if it could unmoor itself and go into another kind of notation where other things could enter, every time I think of that, I think, squeak car noir. Ah! <laughs> so I don't, you know, I don't want to, there's, there's lots of artists who I think have sort of fallen on, on the rocks of that kind of making, which I don't, which I think can get really cutesy. And that's so I, but, what you're describing is something that I find very tempting and that I would really love to have come into the work and I just don't know how to do it yet. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking. Thank um, you. So something that I was sort of noticing kind of as throughout uh, all the work that you showed mm -hmm. uh, was space and how mm -hmm. different works dealt with space. And um, the earlier works, I noticed a, uh, and you know, sharp contrast in the space between the drawings and the paintings. Right. Uh, some uh, The drawings allowing sort of the space to breathe and um, some of the elements of the painting almost denying the space, you know, uh, using these uh, different uh, visual uh, references and things from the Alice in Wonderland. <coughs> right. They're all interconnected. And that sort of led me to thinking about, and you had mentioned this too, the space between those. Uh -huh, right. um, and I feel like something that is, was sort of talked about without directly being stated is how style sort of enters yeah. the work. Yeah. Um, and I feel like throughout the talk, you bridged the two. Uh -huh. um, and how do, you, how do you see that bridge working out of curiosity? Well, it seems like you sort of, um, and this is just mm -hmm. based on what you're saying, that you are sort of seeing these two different ways of working, and then you just wanted to sort of reevaluate, mm -hmm. so then you sort of worked from the ground up, mm -hmm. which is actually sort of interesting because most people, or I mean, it's very common in art school to learn figure drawing and then right. sort of go somewhere else, and then in a sense you're uh, you know, working off. Right. It's almost a very postmodern way of starting, you know, using all these different references and then um, going back to the life drawing to sort of figure out where, what's in between those two right. where it's very sort of um, subject oriented and then multiple references going right. on. 
Um, could you talk a little bit how you feel about style? Well, I, it's interesting. When you're saying that, part of what I'm thinking about is how one of the dictums of CalArts when I was there um, was no information before need. So in other words, they didn't have beginning classes in anything and that, that everybody had to take. They said, okay, if you want to learn this, we'll figure out how to connect you to the person who will teach you that. So you have to figure out who you are as an artist and then we will teach you the things you need in order to do the art that you want to make. And so on the one hand, as somebody who teaches now, I see the problematic nature of that because I have lots of students who can draw their way out of a paper bag but are trying to draw and they don't know how to do it. And so I feel like, okay, well, let me, here, let me show you how to do it. But on the other hand, I do really think it's interesting to just say, okay, what is your idea? Find the language that works and then kind of wrestle your way through that language and see what it is. I, I'm, I, I think the, the, the the style, the polyglot styles that happen in my work, um, I think, started when I was first doing oil painting, and I'd never learned how to oil paint. I mean, I'd, so I, so a friend of mine, Bob Overby, who knew how to oil paint, sort of sat me down and gave me my first kind of basic, you know, don't put the gesso on top of the oil paint. I'm not kidding. I really did that at one point. <laughs> and and. Um, but then I had to figure it out for myself, and it was like every time I sat down to paint something, I didn't have a structure in my head that said, oh, well, okay, the way you paint that is you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and now you have that. So instead, it was like, okay, I don't know how to make this bat. I, I make it this way, and the next time I sit down to paint the next bat, I make it this other way. And, I, I, and it wasn't me sort of consciously saying, I'm grinding my gears and shifting my gears. It was just like, I, I don't know how to do this. And what I felt after a while was that that accurately reflected how my brain actually was working. My thinking, my thinking was not a horizontal kind of even line. My thinking would go like this, and so the images do that too. I don't know if I'm addressing what you're asking about style, but, but so, I'm, so I guess what I'm saying is that the, sen the sense of style shifting is, I hope, a sense of how actually the brain works, and that you shift among different valences as you're as you're trying to parse out an issue. Issue, and you think certain things you see in sharp focus and detail, and other things you see very broadly, and some things you see has a parodic reference to something else, and something else is very clear in its own weird thing. And you're kind of doing all those at once. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Or, yeah. First, thank you for bringing us all those beautiful images. And I noticed that your paintings and your career has like went through different kind of stages, from like reflections on imaginations to self-reflections. Right. Um, I wonder, what do you think is the continuity um, all the way through your different stages, in your paintings? I I would say. Well, a couple things. One thing, one thing is the imagination. I think, I think that really does run through almost all the work. Even the work that's re me just looking at myself in the mirror, there's a kind of sense I keep reinventing my face. Um, I think the other thing, and, I, and this is something I'm not necessarily comfortable with, but it's me for better or for worse. You know, when I said that William Blake was kind of like my godfather and I kind of turned inwards, I think that kind of scarred me for life, <laughs> you know. I mean, so in other words, mm -hmm. I don't think I'm. I, I I admire enormously. I think about Kurt Cowper's work. Kurt Cowper is an artist who I admire enormously, and Kurt is somebody whose work operates completely outside of himself in a way. It operates as a language formed to address certain issues of the peculiarities of the figurative painting at this point in time in history, and. There's other painters I can think of who do that, or other artists I can think of who make works of art that function apart from the self and that in some way address the world, in whose work I really admire. I can't do that. I don't, I'm just, I'm not hardwired for it. And I think that's perhaps a failing in myself, but it's, but it's a failing, it's, it's, it's in my personality, so I have to deal with it. But, but I think that's a through line that goes through the work. 
And I would say the other thing is just simply a love of making. I love, I mean, I think they are all kind of invested in different kinds of making. They, the kinds of making may change, but it, the common note is that I'm really, you know, I've always said I can't, you know, you can go through anything you want in the studio. You can go through despair, you can go through anything, but you can't be bored. You know, boredom is the one deadly thing in the studio. So I really love the act of making. So, yeah. Um, I really appreciated um, the kind of what and how you approached your different permutations of addressing the same language uh, following right. Nate's question. And um, I guess I, I really appreciated how you um, gave us entry points and sort of like your intimate, intimate process. I was more curious about the why. Like why, I mean why, like that's a common thread in our practice. It's like, right. Why do we resist our previous work? Like, why do we hate it so much? Or why do we want to bounce off of it? Right. And um, your reasons for wanting to resist it so much and go into a different avenue. Um, uh -huh. Just kind of, we all have our different reasons, but I'm curious as to yours and why you, you started a resistance towards it and then move towards it and then come back to it. And this took it as kind of. Okay, if, I'm, if I don't answer that, point me back in the right direction. Because <laughs> I, 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 I think what you're asking is, is it, is it necessary to always move forward by a kind of rejection of the past work? Is that okay? So I and I think and that's and that's actually I think that's a really really interesting question. You know, I mentioned Dan McCleary, and um, Dan is an I, I Dan is an artist. Roy Dowell is an artist. These are artists I can think of where their work has been a steady excavation of work that has shifted its ground, but very subtly and quietly, and a deep excavation into, you know, sort of asking, asking the same question in different ways with the belief and the faith that the question will stay alive and keep changing its nature as you do it. So that their work seems very alive to me. I don't look at their work and think, with Dan, oh, another still life. Can't he think of anything else to paint? Because it, it stays alive. Um, by contrast to that, I think of somebody like Karen Carson, who's a, another painter whose work I really love. And Karen, <laughs> a Karen is somebody who I think is really an underrated artist. She's a terrific artist, and part of what she's done is to keep every time she goes into the studio to do a new body of work, it's like she does not make assumptions. She says, "Where do I want to go? I could go anywhere. If I could go anywhere, where would I go?" She is unencumbered by the kind of mythology of her own making. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it really is an individual thing. I understand part of what's interesting about your question, I think, is I think we can buy into the mythology of the reinvention. I think Philip Guston has become sort of the patron saint of that in a lot of ways. We, you know, because you know we do all that. You know, it's an admirable story of a painter who has a set successful career who goes into the studio and, and puts all that aside and creates work that Hilton Kramer finds abysmal and loses his career and then is re-embraced re by a younger generation and goes to heaven. And you know, <laughs> and um, and and I, it's very tempting. It's very seductive to buy into that, and, but I still think also um, it's important when you get to this point with your work where you feel like the production of the work has certain assumptions that are built in, that you are coming to too easily and you're too comfortable with them. You're just, you're just kind of you're in a kind of a warm bath in the studio and you feel like you are in a warm bath of self-acceptance or a warm bath of, you know, um, self, I, I'm, I'm not putting it exactly right, but self-adulation. You know, you know what you're going to make and you know how to make it. And, mm -hmm. and it, I think it's more interesting when the work unnerves you. I think it's more interesting when the work has a voice or a presence where you can have a real conversation with the work because the work is saying something to you you don't recognize. And you can say, really? Is that, is that what I'm saying? Is that what you're saying? What, you know, what the fuck is this thing? Um, then, then you have a, a, a chance for real meaning to spark, I think, that something can really happen. Two unlike things are kind of talking at each other, and something can happen between them that's really interesting. That's, 
that's what interests me about the idea of, of rejection and reinvention, is that kind of dynamic and how that can work. I don't, you know, I, I, my own criticism on my work is I always think I could get more of that, that I, you know, that there's a way to generate more of that. Um, and I don't, you know, I have to push more at that. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Karen. So it's been a really long time since I read this, but um, in Craig Owen's Allegorical Impulse, yeah. he, you know, that was like such an important, you know, essay in terms of quote unquote postmodern pain, but he talks about what he just said two different <coughs> or unlike things, right. at least two, right. but often a multiplicity or multivalency of things that work product, product right. in productive tension against each other. And it's a kind of layering, but it's not layering in the formal sense mm -hmm. of you know a collage or assemblage on top of one another. It's they operate in a field together right. that create a productive tension and are different. And that's what as I was looking at the work, before you even brought up this issue of people say my work's allegorical, I was trying to figure out that read of these very disparate things. Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. very precise line, mm -hmm. the, the kind of, uh, you know, Odeon, Redon, right. you know, kind of pastels. Right, like right. There's so much um, contradiction going on. Mm -hmm. and that's why I think they are allegorical. Because the, these things work together in this in this in this w kind of way of being oppositional or antipodes, then you read them together somehow. Right. Does that make sense? It does. Though I think that this ties back to the question of process, because I think mm -hmm. then the way to get to that field of of meaning being really generated by opposites is to be invested enough in the process that you're not generating the meanings beforehand and you're not even generating how the relationships are going to work right. beforehand. Right. It's kind of this uh, psychic automatism. <laughs> it is, and it can be very problematic, but yes. I mean, I, you know, I constantly, as you, you can probably tell, I, I sort of navigate in my own thinking by thinking of my colleagues and artists I admire and artists in history. So for instance, I'm constantly, when I, when I think of, okay, well, that's the way I think of my work, then I can think immediately of like a handful of people who don't do that, whose work I love. Like I can think of Carol Corumpus, mm -hmm. if you know. Carol's work is extremely predetermined. I mean, it's all worked out ahead of time. But when you see the paintings, they're firing on so many cylinders mm -hmm. that you just you just don't know which which end is up. You know, they're really incredible. But it's completely different from the way I generate meaning because she she understands the oppositions. She understands mm -hmm. what she wants them to do. I feel I have to sort of go into it in productive ignorance. And the problem with productive ignorance is it does kind of play into the great mythology of the artist as dumb bunny. But you know, mm -hmm. it's a useful mythology for me at least right now. Well, speaking of animals, those little mice are so cute. Yeah. That's how I'm going to do my retirement fund. <laughs> 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 and and like I have cute. several right here. <laughs> they're cuter than any mice I've ever seen, and I like their clothing. They're, they're just adorable. But then I've got an orange and pink dress that I can sell you. <laughs> I don't know that you want to go out in public dress like that. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. I have an observation since I've you known you and your work for a really long time and this, this conversation. You started by giving us your, the inside story, mm -hmm. and then you, you made the decision to go to the outside story right. so you could learn the inside story. Okay. Um, my head is spinning. <laughs> point, point me around a little bit. When you made the decision to use yourself, right. it's because my feeling is it took you a long time to get there yeah. from a confidence point of view. Yeah. And that that process taught, didn't teach you, but you re-recognized what you were doing, giving us the first time out. Okay, so in other words, it, well, let me let me say something back and see if it lines up with what you're saying. So for me, though I though I did I, I, there were paintings I did where I inserted myself in the work, but I was just one of the characters. I was just one of the actors on stage. Maybe. You were hiding in the opera. I was hiding in the opera. Yes, I was. I was one of the spear carriers, and so. I needed all those other structures because I did not, I mistrusted the idea of, 
artists who feel that if they put themselves into their work, therefore the work is going to have a more genuine meaning or a deeper meaning or anything like that, and I don't believe that. But when I was confronted with the dilemma where I had to do something that would dismantle all of my preconceptions about how I make my work, where I, where I would be confronted with something where I would come up with a process that would undo my ability to control the image, and I didn't want to hire a model to sit in my studio and have me draw them, and I couldn't relate to that anyway. The cheapest, easiest thing is to start looking in a mirror and drawing myself, and that would then look the Clovis, Clovis Corinth dry point pointed the way in that. Does that? I, I, I think you're hedging. <laughs> um, I, no, because I just, I think that you, you got to a point where, because as you were discussing how the drawings yeah. were simple, and the paintings were complex. Right. The paintings were an opera, and the drawings right, right. were chamber music. Right. You had to get yourself, yourself, uh, to that chamber music place. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also when the paintings became the drawings, mm -hmm. and the drawings became the paintings. Mm -hmm. When they switched places. Yeah. Yeah. That may be one explanation for it. So. Yeah. I apologize for asking two questions. I just no, that's okay. Two in particular. Can we allow it here? <laughs> <laughs> One question apiece, please. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's two paintings in particular. I believe they're right next to each other. It's right. the one, for lack of a better uh, improvised title, the alien penis one. Oh, yes. And the, um, the bird right. with the fish. Right. Um, I feel like it's, if we're going to look at this as sort of an uh, abstract narrative where you're uh -huh. sort of going from one place to another, they really sort of seem to be in the middle. And they seem to have a lot of similarities, and yeah. they really stood out right. to me. Um, and I feel like in some ways they're doing a very similar thing, while in other ways they're doing very different things. How would you identify the similarity? I guess the gaze would okay. be the similarity. Okay. would be um, the living looking at the dead, right. I guess. Right. Um, and I guess, could you just talk a little bit about why you put those two together, sort of, are those, is that just an illusion that they're made around the same time? No, no, they're made, no, they're made around the same time. Okay. They're made around the same time, though I think one thing that's important is that there's a kind of, it takes me a long time to make my work, not as long as it's been rumored to take, but it takes a long time for me to make my work. <laughs> um, and, um, and I don't tend to paint in a way where I say, oh, the painting with the flounder and the heron, that was really successful. Well, now let's do one with another bird and another kind of animal in the water. I, I really feel like, okay, I do one painting and that painting addresses certain issues and now let's move on. We're going to go do another painting that addresses other issues. So. There is a kind of way that I can have two paintings like that side by side in the studio. They aren't, they aren't done, they're done sequentially, they're not done simultaneous. So in other words, I won't have both those paintings in a process of making. One will be done, and then I'll go, okay, now let's do another, and then I do another one. So in terms of meanings, I think what you're saying is really interesting and something that I had not thought about in terms of how the gaze works in those two paintings. What I thought about more when I, when I made them was more just sheer making and process, because I was very aware that I was kind of, in each of them, there is no rupture of the language. You know, the language is completely unified. There's no, even in the St. Eustace painting, the, the language kind of gets broken up by some of how it's painted. But in those two paintings, it's kind of a completely illusionistic language that's all unified. And that was interesting to do. That's not something I've done really, is to make a completely unified painting in that way. I, I don't know that I want to go down that road a whole lot, because I feel that that road's kind of a trap again for me, but, but does that answer what you're asking yeah, to I'm some extent? Curious. Which one came first? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I, I think, think that Aaron came first. You think so? I, I don't remember. I don't remember. It's, you know. <laughs> they, I, I do know Eustace came first. I know the big one came first. That was done first. I think the small ones were done second. And then the one I don't, that I think is unsuccessful, was the last one. So, 
Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Like Karen, I really love your mice and dresses. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and your men I'm sorry, dresses. it's a line that's no longer in operation. <laughs> it's like, you know. And your men and dresses, so I'm wondering if it is something that's going to be in operation or if something you would be thinking about or we'll see in the future. Well, I, um, I was thinking about this recently about how I. I think that most of us mine certain territories in our work as we go through our life and that certain things just come back up over and over. So it's probably not the case that one puts anything, in, in terms of really deep images or deep concerns in one's work, that those things probably just keep bubbling up. So I would not be at all surprised if 10 years from now, there were paintings that had men in dresses, to say nothing of paintings that had a kind of sprawl to them again. I, right now, I just, I'd rather kill myself than do those paintings. But, but I wouldn't be surprised if they came back in, just because that's the way sort of it works. The men in the dresses, I'm really <coughs> fond of them. I feel very personal. I mean, I feel like they're really like, you know, I, I drew them so much and I painted them so much that I, I have this real sense of fondness about who they are and how they function. But that's kind of deadly right now for me. It's sort of like uh, that's kind of getting into the territory of fond fantasy, and I don't think it's really productive as art making. And um, the mice coming into the mice was interesting because it sort of allowed me to sort of go into the same territory a little bit through another doorway. But even there, I think I was thinking about this recently because I'm there's another painting I started in the studio, and it's going to have one of the mice in it, and I found myself thinking, well, I only got like so many of these mice, you know. <laughs> and then I thought, that's a danger sign if you start thinking that way. You know, there's you know, there's six mice, I'll do six paintings. No, forget it. You know, it's just I there's certain areas of content, I think, that we run through, and then once we run through them, we have to trust that they they played out for at least that period of time in our work, and they're not going to be resonant enough to make us ask questions. They're just, they're things that we may love. and they're, Like I love, I love puppet theaters, I love theaters still, but all that stuff I, I can love apart from my work. But the questions I want to ask myself when I'm in the studio now have to be other questions in order to get me to make the work that pushes me forward. Other questions? Comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. It was, it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs>